This week on Book Notes, our guest is Donald Kagan, professor of history, classics, and Western civilization at Yale University. He joins us to discuss his recent book, On the Origins of War. Donald Kagan, author of On the Origins of War, you say in the introduction that you started this first by teaching it to high school kids. Yes. It's a very strange and interesting, wonderful experience. They're at Cornell University, they have a, a scholarship house. Uh, and in, as one of their recruiting devices, they go all around the country, pick out some of the brightest high school juniors, just finished their junior year, bring them to Cornell and expose them to a couple of Cornell professors or a couple of professors uh, in a seminar of some kind or another. So a colleague of mine and I, uh, d dreamed up this idea of doing one uh, comparative study of the origins of war. And uh, it was wonderful just because the subject was so exciting for us. But of course, these are terribly smart kids. And uh, something about a 16-year-old kid that sparks you in a way that very little else does. What year was that? I guess it was 67. Yes, it was 67, 1967. What do high school kids care about at that well, of age. course, the Vietnam War was just coming into people's consciousness in a serious way at that point. And, of course, we had to treat that one as one of the examples. So that was very much on their minds. And every war, it was, in a way, it was a wonderful learning device because every war we looked at, even ancient ones, they saw with a special uh, vividness because they were thinking about the Vietnamese thing. And so when we got to Vietnam, it had, of course, a very special and powerful meaning for them. Uh, having looked at these other ones by comparison. Now, for your book, you picked, I believe, five different yes. wars or the Cuban crises. Missile crisis, Cuban right. missile crisis. Tell us what those five were and why did you pick them? Yeah. Uh, there are two ancient wars, two modern wars, and then the missile crisis where there's a happy ending. Uh, the, the first one is the Peloponnesian War, in which the Athenians and the Spartans are the major opponents. The First World War the Second Punic War between Rome and Carthage, the Second World War, and the Missile Crisis itself. And we, I don't move uh, chronologically. I do it by those two pairs before we get to the Missile Crisis because I find that there are very interesting analogies between the Peloponnesian War and the First World War and the Punic War and the Second World War. And one of my uh, inquiries, really, when I got started was to see can you learn anything useful about things we're interested in today by examining uh, experiences of human beings at different periods of time, different places, different kinds of societies? Is there anything common? And so I, when I thought I saw some interesting analogies, I put them together to help to be instructive in that way. Is war inevitable? <clears throat> I hate to say anything is inevitable in the human realm. What I can say is that there's hardly been a time in human history when there hasn't been war. And I must say, reg regretfully, that I don't see that anything has changed so much as to make it unlikely in the future. There are some bright spots to go with the dark spots. I think that the uh, presence of nuclear weapons actually does help to deter war. But, of course, it is a high price, because if you, if you miss with one of those situations, the price for going to war is that much greater. Even so, since nuclear weapons, there have been wars. There haven't been the great big ones that we were accustomed to in the 20th century, but there have been very serious wars and continue to be. You quoted uh, from the 1968 uh, Will and Ariel Durant book on civilization, I believe, that uh, in 3,421 years, there have only been 268 years without war. Yeah. What do you call war, though? I call war the organized use of violence and force to achieve the end of a political entity, something along those lines, uh, against another political entity, states. Let's use the word state because that's really what we're talking about. Are there wars going on around the, United, around the world now? Let me think. Um, this, yes, because by definition, the war in f the former Yugoslavia is now between states. I mean, the Bosnians are fighting among themselves, that's true. But Serbia is a separate country, and Serbia is clearly engaged in what I think is aggression against Bosnia. And Croatia is a state, and the Croatians are engaged. So yes, I guess that's certainly one example. How does right now in this world compare to all the years that have gone before us? 
I mean, in terms of how much fighting is and how serious the fighting is. Right. This, this is a, a pretty good time compared to many. Uh, there isn't a major war going on anywhere in the world involving very large populations and so on. Uh, and the number of real wars going on is probably fewer than has been true for much of the time. Uh, so yeah, I think we're in a relatively peaceful time just now. When did you first get interested in war yourself? Well, I was always interested in history. And of course, history, the study of history is inevitably very much in, involved in the study of war for the reasons that the Durants make clear. So from a f fairly early time. But I only became seriously interested in it and professionally interested in it when I began to study Thucydides, the great historian of the Peloponnesian War. And it was only then, really, that my mind focused on war, and most particularly, it still focuses more on the question of how they get started than on the question of how they proceed after they get started, though I'm interested in that, too. Have you ever fought in a war? I never have, and uh, uh, that's been a piece of good fortune. But, of course, I've, my life has been... Uh, I've had a personal experience of observing and living through some of the most serious wars that the world has ever seen. The Second World War had a particularly powerful influence upon my thinking and imagination. How old were you in 1941? 41, I would have only been nine years old, but it's amazing how tuned in I was to it. Uh, Where were you then? I was in Brooklyn. I was a kid growing up uh, in Brooklyn, and New York City and Brooklyn w were places where this was much more alive and real than it might have been in Peoria. Uh, we were very tuned in. I remember as a kid, the old folks used to listen to Hitler's radio broadcasts. I would have heard some of those. And Roosevelt, of course, was a mythical figure for me, a uh, gigantic figure, the only president I could ever imagine. And when I, uh, when I was at that age, he was mostly talking about foreign affairs. And so this was, these were the first powerful impressions on me. What were your parents doing then? Well, my, I, my father died when I was an infant, but my mother was a, a worker, and she was working at her, uh, uh, in a factory when I was a, a kid. And, uh, but nonetheless, very tuned in. She was born in Europe, you see. So was I. I, was, I came over when I was uh, less than two years old. But, uh, so for us, all of that, what was happening in Europe was not distant and strange, but it was a continuation of what we had been accustomed to. What country in Europe? Lithuania. You ever go back? I never have been back to Lithuania, no. Brothers and sisters? I had an older sister who's uh, dead now. College? Uh, I went to Brooklyn College. Um, and then I went to, to graduate work later on briefly at Brown and then finally at Ohio State. And where are you now? I'm at Yale. Doing what? I'm a professor. I have a fancy title. I'm a Bass professor of history, classics, and Western civilization. That's a very fancy title. Who is Bass? Uh, Lee Bass is a uh, Texan businessman who made a major contribution to Yale to establish a number of professorships for the purpose of uh, fostering, supporting, and uh, perpetuating the study of Western civilization at Yale. You mentioned Thucydides. Yes. Now, for those people that don't follow the ancient historians, right. how do you make that interesting? It's real easy. All you have to do is read them. Uh, you know, it's amazing how powerful the influence of Thucydides is just now. Uh, last time I looked, if you went to take a course in uh, the fundamental course in history, now what are they called? Uh, I'm trying to, well, something about history and politics or whatever it is, at the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, where officers of middling rank come and spend a year away from their duty on their way to higher positions in not only the Navy, by the way, and other offices. While they're at sea on their ship, they get a, a book. It's Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War because it's the first thing that they study in their uh, study of the history of warfare and strategy. Strategy and policy is the name of the course. And it goes through the centuries. If you take a course in international relations anywhere at Kennedy School, at Harvard, you will start very likely with Thucydides. And so it is around the country. And that's because, it's not, just, it's not some kind of a, a relic. The impression of the people who teach those courses is that, that we have something to learn about war and politics and diplomacy from this guy who lived 2,500 years ago. So it's not a hard sell because just start reading it and it speaks to you. Who was he? He was an Athenian nobleman who uh, grew up in the middle of the 5th century B B.C. He became a great admirer of the democratic leader Pericles, who was the great 
figure in fifth century Athens. He became a general. He fought in this great war that he described. And then he, he had some bad luck. He was in command of a naval dis, uh, force up in northern Greece at the time that a key Athenian city, city was lost to the other side. And he was held responsible. The Athenian people condemned him, and he was, went off into exile, where he spent the rest of the war, for which he suffered a lot. But we're very grateful, because that gave him the time to continue to write the history that he was writing. And it gave him access to both sides in the war. So he was able to speak to Spartans as well as Athenians. And that helped to produce this amazing work that he uh, wrote. What's so special about it? I would say the thing that's amazing about him is his capacity to hold a number of very important but very different, you would almost say contradictory ideas in his head at the same time. I'll give you an example of one pair that impresses me. Uh, on the one hand, he had a very pessimistic view of what it was possible for human beings to achieve. He, he felt that there were forces in human society that just had their way, and there was nothing that you could do about many of them. On the other hand, and apparently contradictorily, his whole work is a denial of that. It's meant to be, as he put it himself, very immodestly but accurately, a possession forever. That is, he assumed that things that happened in the past provided patterns that would allow rare individuals, not everybody, who were smart enough to see what it all meant, ways of understanding human behavior that would repeat itself in time, and then you could do something about it. So at the same time, there were these vast forces that were so hard to manage. But some people, smart enough and in the right place, could make a difference. So that his great hero, Pericles, he felt, made a difference. And yet, if you look at it, things didn't work out well for Pericles. And if the cities were asked, how come, he'd say, there are some things that are just out of the control of even the wisest and best educated person. So that's one example. Uh, the five wars are the one crisis that you write about in here. Um, if you could have any number of these people in front of you to talk to an interview, who would you pick and why? I guess it would, it would actually be uh, Pericles, just because we have so little from him or that is reliable about him that we need to speculate so much. Whereas, if you're talking at the other extreme, it's been so exciting for me as an ancient historian to be permitted to roam around in the recent history. The m materials that have come up, come up about the missile crisis in the last two, three, four years that have totally changed my impression of what happened. And we now have, well, I'll give you an example. There are now tapes that are now publicly available, transcripts of them of what Kennedy and his advisors said to each other, well, of course you know this, uh, during the missile crisis in the White House making those decisions. We have it with the bad grammar and the ers and the uhs, and I know exactly what they said to each other. It's the most amazing thing in the world for an ancient historian. You say in that section that people were lying to us. There were some lies told. There's no question about that. Who told the biggest? I, I suppose the single, well, this, the single biggest lie, I guess, was at the end of the story when uh, Secretary McNamara was asked in a Senate hearing specifically, had there been a deal to trade the Turkish missiles for the Cuban missiles? And he said, no, absolutely not. And it's now absolutely clear that there was a very specific, clear-cut deal in which that trade was made. Only the promise was that the, the Cuban missiles would come first and the Tur Turkish missiles would come later. Now, for <coughs> someone that wasn't around during the Cuban Missile Crisis, we're too young to remember, when did it happen? It was in October of 1962 uh, that the crisis took place. Uh, President Kennedy announced the fact uh, on the 22nd of October of 1962. What was it? What was the crisis? <clears throat> the Russians were in the process on October the 22nd of placing missiles in Cuba with nuclear warheads that were capable of striking the largest part of the United States. And they were doing this, as in, in Kennedy's word, clandestinely. And they were doing it after having lied about it repeatedly over a stretch of time. That combination of circumstances made it seem alarming to uh, 
a variety of people, even including Kennedy, even including Kennedy, because he ended up taking the mildest line towards it. But of course, he understood how serious it was. Now you talk about something called the XCOM. Yes. What was that? That's the executive committee of the Security Council. It was the group that Kennedy gathered around him to give him advice and to consult with uh, in managing the crisis. And it was uh, his selection. It wasn't an automatic group that already existed. Most of the important officials of the government who were relevant to this were involved. But also there were people who of, of um, considerable experience at different times who were not part of the government. Example would be Dean Acheson, a former Secretary of State, was one of the people he called upon. But uh, the rest were active uh, participants in the government at the time. Now, you say he taped those sessions. Secretly. <clears throat> and that's another interesting and wonderful part about it. He was the only one who knew that the tape was going. Probably Bobby Kennedy knew. He generally knew everything that Jack did. And how did you find out about the taping? It's been published. Uh, they, they, I guess they're in the Kennedy Library, the tapes themselves. And through this, uh, you know, the Freedom of Information Act, people have been able to get hold of that prior, before they would have otherwise been released. And now there have been people who have simply published the transcripts of those tapes. Have you listened to any of the tapes? I haven't listened to them. No, I read them. You read all the transcripts? I, everything I get my hands on. <laughs> now, how, do you, how does someone like you get to those transcripts? Oh, well, it's now very simple because, as I say, they've now been, uh, that they've now been published. In a, the book that was actually most helpful to me, uh, a couple of scholars uh, simply published everything that was relevant to this situation in a fairly large-sized book using photocopies of the material whenever that was relevant and photocopies of the transcript when that was uh, the issue. If we didn't have the Freedom of Information Act, would we know this? No. No. Before we go on with more of the Cuban Missile Crisis, yes. what, about, what does that say about history then? A lot of, are there a lot of things back there in your coverage of the First World War, or Second World War, the Peloponnesian War, that we don't know because uh -oh. of secrecy? Well, in the case of the ancient world, it's more a question of stuff that was never written down at all and stuff that, was never, that we just don't have. It's been lost in the course of time. But if you get to the First World War, there's a very interesting situation because for political reasons, really, having to do with what happened after the First World War, astonishing numbers of documents were published that never would have been except for that. People were trying to argue a case. The Germans are trying to say the war guilt clause blaming us for First World War is wrong. So they published a lot of documents to prove their case, carefully arranged, carefully selected, and a little bit doctored. So that made the British and the French start publishing documents to prove their case. And it went back and forth and back and forth. And then scholars got into the game because it was a live argument that had to do with policy at the time. So that the documentation of the First World War origins is almost unbelievably uh, strong for that period of time. But that's, other periods are not so well documented for, that the, because those reasons were lacking. You said that Thucydides could predict somewhat where things were going to go, or he said that if you're smart enough... And you know what happened. No, 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 let's go to the Cuban Missile yes. Crisis. What would he say before that even started would happen, based on history? <clears throat> well, he, he, before it started, you know, nobody could have said anything. The, the first sort of critical thing that happened, I think, that was unpredictable, because there, and Thucydides would have said immediately, there are, most things are unpredictable, is that Khrushchev made a judgment. He, he said, I can solve a lot of my problems, domestic, foreign policy, military, if I can plant these missiles in Cuba. And the question that uh, next must have occurred to him was, can I get away with it? And the critical answer in my judgment was that he thought, I can get away with it because my judgment of President Kennedy is that he will let me. Now, he, now that's, then comes the interesting step that Thucydides would have had comments about, I think. How did he come to that conclusion? And the answer lies in the track record that Kennedy had accomplished in the rather short time that he had been president, beginning in January of 1961, down to the time that Khrushchev made that decision in the spring of 1962. The Bay of Pigs disaster was the first step. And I guess I shouldn't assume anybody remembers what happened there, but Kennedy inherited a plan to get rid of Castro in Cuba by having Cuban exiles land there, supported by American forces. And he inherited that from the Eisenhower administration, changed it, watered it down, and then let it happen. But when the critical moment came, he backed off and allowed the invaders to be either killed or captured. 
the lesson that everybody got from that pretty much, certainly we know Khrushchev did, was that Kennedy was seen to be weak, indecisive, the kind of guy you could push around. Kennedy himself feared that that was the impression that had been given. We have plenty of documentation to that effect. So that was one thing. A second thing was Ke uh, Kennedy and Khrushchev had a summit conference one-on-one -on -one in Vienna in uh, the spring of 61. And we now have what is obviously a very reliable record of what was said there, too. And it's an astonishing conversation in which Khrushchev really treats Kennedy very roughly. Uh, for instance, Rusk made a comment, Dean Rusk, the Secretary of State at the time, made a comment that one thing you never do in diplomacy, he said, is use the word war. But Khrushchev used that word many times in the course of that conversation. Well, you know, until we had the document in s itself before us, the record of what had gone on, we were pretty much left to, uh, the, for knowledge of it, to two books that had been written by Kennedy uh, administration uh, intellectuals, uh, Arthur Schlesinger and Ted Sorensen, who had written biographies, in, in a way, of uh, Kennedy or, or accounts of his presidency. And their accounts basically said, uh, Kennedy gave as good as he got and pretty much uh, that was the result of the Vienna Conference. Well, we now know that Kennedy said to the New York Times uh, uh, columnist uh, James Reston, right after he came away from the last session with Khrushchev saying, quote, he beat the hell out of me. And his own reading of it was that he was very worried that Khrushchev had come away with the sense that this was a guy who could be pushed around. He was right. You where'd, you, where'd you get that? That is, uh, I'm trying to, I, th I think, I, got, I think I got it secondhand from uh, Michael Bushloss's very fine book on, on this subject, but I think he may have gotten it from something that Reston wrote. I'm sorry, I don't recollect the source on that. Well, uh, both <coughs> Michael Bushloss and James Reston have been here with their books relative to all this on book notes. Right. Uh, and Mr. Reston wrote a, you know, a, a biography or an autobiography right. uh, of himself a couple years ago. Right. I, I, I haven't read the autobiography. I, I, as I say, I got the secondhand from Bushloss. Did you go into... Let's just stay with the Cuban Missile yeah. Crisis for a moment. Did you go into that with a certain attitude? Oh, yes. And did you change your attitude yeah. Yeah. the more you learned? For years, I had been teaching it pretty much in accordance with what I would now would call the official Kennedy administration line. Basically, I believe the accounts of uh, Schlesinger and Sorensen and, and Bobby Kennedy's very influential uh, memoir of that called 13 Days. It was a very important uh, book. Well, now I know, not merely that there were the biases and the prejudices that are inherent of any participant in a historical event, but in, uh, this is very interesting, actually. Tw on the 25th anniversary of the missile crisis, there were conferences held uh, in different places of the participants in the events and a number of other people who knew about it. And these have been wonderful sources for what went on. People sort of reminisced as to what had gone on, Russians, Americans, Cubans, and so on, uh, and exchanged with each other, asked each other questions, answered the questions, and they're marvelous. Well, in one of those discussions, I think it was 1989, um, Sorensen admitted, that, for instance, I'll give you one example, that uh, in an exchange between Robert Kennedy and uh, Dobrynin, the Russian admin, uh, uh, ambassador to the United States, at a critical moment in the crisis, uh, that uh, Kennedy had formally, Bob Kennedy had formally uh, included the trade of the Cuban missiles for the Turkish missiles. And uh, Sorensen admitted that he, as editor of that manuscript, edited it out. And he said he did so because it was a secret, uh, not only from the country, but it was a secret from most of the players. There were only a few people who knew about it. But that shows you, you know, what the problem is with the documents before you get behind the first range. I used to believe that story as told by them, which more or less was a picture of uh, this uh, brave, tough president who managed to work his way out of the crisis by a combination of toughness and moderation and care in controlling the level of escalation. Uh, I came away after reading all the new material that I've gotten thinking that they got into the crisis because there was a lack of toughness, and it was perceived even more strongly by Khrushchev than the reality was. And that, in fact, during the crisis, the president was actually prepared to make 
just about any concession rather than to use military force at any point. And that what forced him to take as hard a line even as he did was the fact that there was dissension even within the XCOM. There were important players who just wouldn't have it, who were insisting upon military action someplace down the road. Let me ask you a hypothetical. Yeah. If you were advising a president <clears throat> today, based on that experience, would you say, you better get your people out writing your books first? It certainly will help. There is no question about it. Who gets his story out there really makes a difference. In your book, again, you do the five different sections. And I went through and just for the fun of it, counted the pages devoted to each, each section. And I just wanted to ask you whether that had anything to do with the importance you put on it. The Peloponnesian War got 60 pages, World War I, 133, Hannibal's War, 41, World War II, 136, and the Cuban Missile Crisis, 111. No. The main reason for the length had to do with the documentation. <clears throat> We know much less about the ancient wars than we do about the modern wars. And to go on and have some more speculation for about twice the length of the evidence, I didn't think was a useful activity. As between the modern wars, it's largely a question of documentation, but not entirely. Sometimes it was just a question of what were the points I was trying to make and how much time or space did it take to get it. But no, it's not a reflection of importance. When did you actually start working on this book with a contract? Uh, I sat down to start writing that in the fall of 92, I think that's right, in September of 92. When did you get the first idea, other than you mentioned that teaching the seminar for high school students, but when did you really have the idea to, to do this book? Some, I can't tell you that was precision, but sometime 15 years or so after I'd been teaching the course, students kept saying to me, you know, this is all great, but you really have an obligation to try to put down somewhere in one place what you make of all of this. And so the idea went, in, in answering them, I said, after I know what I think I make of all of it, then maybe I'll write a book about it, but I don't know yet. <laughs> but at a certain point, I came to the conclusion that I did have some general views, that I had learned something that had more than specific significance, and that probably someday I really ought to uh, put it down and see how it worked. And uh, this began to, when I finished my last book, uh, I had asked me, what shall I do next? I thought, well, maybe now's the time. How long have you been at Yale? Uh, this is my 26th year. In the introduction, uh, you have a dedication for Bob and Fred. Yes. And then you write a little bit about them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Who are they? Bob and Fred are my two sons. Uh, Bob is the older, and he is uh, uh, a very interesting fellow who, uh, um, went to Yale, and then he went to the uh, uh, Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, and then he went into the government, and he put in a, a batch of years working mostly in the State Department. And As a political job? A, a political job, yes. For which president? Uh, for President Reagan. And he, um, he has taught me so very much that I would never have known otherwise, because as a practitioner in the world of international relations, foreign affairs, uh, he has brought the real world home to me uh, and taught me an amazing amount, and I wanted to uh, express my gratitude for that. Now he's decided that, he, of all things, he wants to be a historian. He's written a book on the subject that he was working on in the government. He's written a book on America's uh, involvement in Nicaragua uh, from 1979 until the uh, elections that put out the Sandinistas, which will be coming out next fall. So he got the taste of what it is to be a historian. So he's now a graduate student at the American University doing American history to try to get to be a professional historian. American here in town. Here in town. Give us an example of something he taught you. Well, one of the things that he's explained to me about uh, modern uh, events is that there is this, the closest possible interrelationship between foreign policy, domestic politics. And I'll, mind you, I had always known this in a general way, but in the detail that he was able to show it to me. And finally, in the functioning of the media, that there's a three-way interrelationship. They affect each other enormously every single day. And that if you don't always ask the question, how does one affect the other? How is one derived from the other? You're missing a very critical element of what's happening. That's been a great uh, blessing to me, especially as I was doing the, uh, the uh, missile crisis chapter.
correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you wrote several times in the, or at least you quoted people that were members of the XCOM, the yes. President Kennedy's committee, as saying this is a national problem, not an international problem. Uh, or, or to put, yes, or to put it another way, this is a domestic political problem. This was the line taken very much by McNamara and by Kennedy, and of supporting that view very strongly is uh, Sorensen. And that, uh, to my mind, was one of the problems with their perception of what was happening out there. They didn't really think this was serious. Both Kennedy and M McNamara have been quoted right, uh, accurately, I'm sure, to say, it doesn't matter whether you're hit by a missile that comes from Moscow or one that comes from Cuba. Now, if you believe that, then there's no reason to get excited if Khrushchev puts missiles into Cuba. And the only reason they saw a problem was that they would be beaten to death by their political opponents if they didn't do something about it. To me, that's a stunning failure of understanding international relations and power politics, which are the realities out there. Thucydides would have held his head in pain at that statement because uh, they were wrong. Uh, uh, would you like me to say a little bit more about that? Sure. I mean, they were wrong because everybody else in the game perceived that it did make a great deal of difference. For one thing, there were some very practical matters. At that time, as best we can figure out, the Russians seemed to have had about 20 operational missiles that could have hit the United States that would have been launched from Russia at that time. Uh, we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Uh, but not only that, it's hard to know what they would have hit. They were very poorly aimed and so on. They put, they, the goal was to put 40 missiles in Cuba, which would have doubled their actual payload capacity. But they couldn't miss from Cuba. And so the issue, as some Russians point, have pointed out, was it doesn't matter how many missiles you have. It's how many missiles can you deliver? Suddenly, the balance of power was changed really very significantly by what the Russians actually could do. But secondly, whatever we might say about it, everybody in the world would have said, the Russians have just changed the situation. They're stronger now. The Americans are weaker now. And so everybody's reaction to power would have changed. But finally, Kennedy's own credibility would have been so severely damaged. He let that happen, and most people would have said, why did you let that happen, rightly or wrongly? The perception would have been deadly. He didn't seem to grasp that. It was the politics in America that seemed to have been decisive. Was there anything unusual about the way the Kennedy administration handled that particular event compared to either past administrations? And was it any kind of a turning point in history? Well, it turned out, uh, in, in a funny way, it didn't turn out to be a turning point uh, in a way that you would have anticipated it. Uh, neither did it lead to uh, everybody sort of pulled back from the terrible brink and said, now let's not do dangerous things and stop being rivals and be friends, which was what a lot of people hoped would be the result immediately. Nor, on the other hand, did it create a sort of a tremendous immediate crisis. What happened was that the Russians kept on going doing what they were doing, namely relying upon force, attempting to increase their missile capacity, and doing so with great success over the next decade or so. But the McNamara doctrine that emerged from it, based upon what they called minimal deterrence, was that uh, we didn't need to worry about that, that it didn't matter if the Soviet Union came to have as much missile, nuclear missile power as we did, or even more, so long as we had enough to do a lot of harm for them. The trouble was, in my judgment, that we accepted the concept of minimal deterrence, but the Russians didn't. That they thought they could gain politically around the world by increasing their actual power, and they did. You uh, earlier mm -hmm. talked about your son Bob, also your son Fred. Yes, now, I don't want to slight Fred. You know, he, had a, <laughs> he had a different impact on you. Yes. For what reason? Fred is also a, a graduate student who is working uh, uh, on a Ph.D. in history. By the way, how old is Bob and how old is Fred? Bob's 36 and Fred's 25. <clears throat> but Fred's a Russian historian. And uh, one of his assistances to me was, first of all, that he can read Russian and I can't. So he was able to translate documents for me and get me at stuff I couldn't have gotten at otherwise. But he also has a very wonderful understanding of the history of Russia and of the, the Soviet Union and, and how it works. And he particularly was able to instruct me in military doctrine and the way in which politics and the military worked in Soviet Russia.
something I didn't understand adequately. And I think many people who write about the subject don't understand adequately. So it's in those areas that Fred educated me. I, I strongly advise people to have uh, children because you can learn a lot from them. What's your connection to the Hoover Institution? None at all. Uh, I was uh, out at uh, the Center for Behavioral Studies, for, for the Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford for a year. That's where I wrote the bulk of the book. And while I was there, the Hoover Institution was kind enough to be hospitable to me uh, in a social way. And so uh, uh, I spent some time over there just talking to people and enjoying their company, but that's all. How did you go about deciding how to do the book? Well, you know, it's amazing how closely the book uh, reflects the organization of the course. So I suppose the question is, how did I go about uh, doing that? Uh, and some of it was accidental, and some of it, I think, just reflects the way I see things. Uh, I started with the Peloponnesian War. My trade is I'm a historian of ancient Greece. And so I wrote a, a book on the origins of the, uh, it's called The Outbreak of the Peloponnesian War. But I had always been fascinated by the origins of the First World War. That had been a, a, a subject of great interest to me. And I had always, as soon as I learned about the Peloponnesian War, I, I began, I saw these very interesting similarities, it seemed to me, that seemed to me to enlighten things both ways from time to time. Give us a couple. Let's see if I can think of some off the top of my head that uh, continue to work for me. Well, for one thing, you have the uh, situation of a world in which there has been one power that was largely the dominant power, not too strongly questioned by other powers. And along comes a new power that very swiftly emerges as a potential competitor. And how do you deal with resolving that situation? In the case of the ancient world, it was Sparta that was the dominant power for a very long time. And then over a rather short space of time, Athens just shot to the fore and became a great power overnight. And the leader of a great coalition which could be opposed to the great Spartan coalition and their rivalry then proceeded apace. Well, Britain was the dominant power in Europe over the course of the 19th century, but when uh, Germany was invented by a series of swift wars, uh, suddenly in 1871 the German Empire was there and nothing like it had existed before. The problem was how do you cope? Well, again, in the first part of the period in the ancient world that I study, the Athenians under Pericles, they have a shot at competition, and then they make the decision, let's see if we can't work this out. Let's see if we can't establish a, a, an equilibrium. And there was an attempt made to do that, and I think it had a, a chance of succeeding, but it broke down for a number of reasons. In the European case, <clears throat> I think Germany under Bismarck made the decision. Bismarck certainly did. Germany has achieved what it needs to achieve. Any further risk-taking will put at, at, uh, put at risk everything we've done up to now. Our interests are in preserving what we have rather than expanding further. And so Bismarck worked very hard, just as I think Pericles was working very hard, at preserving the peace in the interests of his own nation. And that's, by the way, one of the messages that I think the book has, is that for peace to exist, Somebody has to work hard at it. It's not, peace doesn't keep itself, as I say in the book. I think it's very important for it to understand somebody and the person, the state that has to do it is the state that has the greatest interest in preserving the peace, has the power to do it, has to work at it. All right, let me just yeah, interrupt please. because that leads us to right to today. <clears throat> um, where is the United States in your theory today? Well, the United States finds itself in a very unusual <clears throat> situation with, I think, spectacularly unusual opportunities. I think, in a way, the prospects for future peace are probably as great as they have ever been in modern history. Uh, why? Because we do have a state that is the predominant power in the world, and it is Truly, it is true, in my opinion, that it has no aggressive intentions, no expansive desires or needs, but everybody also knows that. So you, and that was true of, uh, of uh, Bismarck after he made that clear. So that you have a situation where such a state now has an interest in keeping the peace, has the capacity to keep the peace, and can do so in a way that will not irritate people more than is necessary. What's left is this. 
Such a state must first of all understand that it has an obligation, as I think it does, to work at keeping the peace. Obligation to itself, no less than to the other countries. And what does that mean? It needs to make sacrifices now in peacetime so that it will not have to make much greater sacrifices in a war should it come later on. Those sacrifices mean spending the money necessary to have an adequate military force and other forms <coughs> of peacekeeping. And the will to take the trouble, run the risks, and occasionally fight the fights and suffer the casualties that are part of that job. The presence of atomic weapons, I think, likewise, is, can be a plus, a plus in deterring recklessness. But there's nothing automatic about it. You have to work at it. You have to constantly reevaluate what needs to be done to make the world safe in an atomic world. So, on the one hand, the opportunity strikes me as being very, very great. If the United States were willing to take the lead, were skillful in doing it, I think it could have others helping to do that. There are other states that have every bit as much uh, reason to preserve the peace as we do, uh, but they are always reluctant to pay the price. There has to be some leadership out there, or nobody will follow. <clears throat> you mentioned power and two categories, realists and neorealists? Uh, yeah, I think that's, those are the terms the political scientists use. What's the difference? Well, who's a realist? Uh, Morgenthau, Hans Morgenthau was the, the king of the realists. Uh, and uh, who was he? Uh, he was a political scientist. I guess he was uh, German originally. Came to the United States and sort of dominated the, uh, the the scene in international relations for a very long time. And he's had many, many followers. And it's a very uh, powerful school. But as best I can tell the difference, and I'm just a poor historian. I can't understand these high philosophical distinctions. But the, the realists seem to think that they both agree that power is what it's about, and I think they're right. But the, the realists seem to say. Everybody wants all the power he can get, all the power there is. It, it is a Hobbesian world of all against all. It never stops. As I understand the neorealists, they take a slightly less grim view of things. They think everybody wants security, and they want the power that will bring them the security. But presumably, if you could create a system in which there was enough security to go around, everybody would have enough power to feel secure, they wouldn't have to keep going at each other. As far as I can tell, that's the main difference between the two. Looking at Europe, and you write, of course, about Germany, both in World War I and World War II. Yes. <clears throat> what do you see with Germany today? Well, right now, uh, I, I see no great reason for alarm. Uh, not only is Germany, uh, on the one hand, Germany is, again, all of Germany, and it's a large, powerful, potentially powerful state. But it is not a highly armed state, and it is not the same Germany that the Kaiser's Germany or Hitler's Germany were. It's a country that's, you know, had a long stretch now, both of peace and of a democratic regime and of a free market and a prosperity. And those things matter, and they change things. But I think we shouldn't be too complacent, because ever since the invention of Germany, I mean, it didn't exist before 1871, Europe has not found a way to deal with a united Germany. The very, its existence in the hands of irresponsible leaders like the Kaiser led to the First World War. Its uh, attempt to restore itself to what seemed like its natural power position is what uh, brought Hitler to power and brought the Second World War. The unnatural situation of a divided Germany has helped conceal the, the continuing problem. But what happens when Germany gets back into power? This plays into the question of why it's important for the United States to exercise leadership. If we don't, one of these days, who can tell when, the Germans will do what any powerful, independent nation will do. They will seek their own security. They will look to military strength, like everybody else does, to try to keep their safety. If they perceive dangers, uh, they, they might get themselves into a war. Or, if at a certain point they're annoyed or irritated for reasons that people are from time to time, they might once again be a problem. We can't predict how that's going to happen, but I think it's predictable that one day they will return to the status of great power. Again, because you write about this a lot, <clears throat> the French and the Germans sitting side by side. Over the years, the Alsace-Lorraine area has been both German and French, French right. and back and forth. Now it's in France. Right. What is it about, what comes first? The people, the kind of people they are that lead themselves into war, or is it a leader that leads a group of people into war? 
Well, you know, they all play a part, but I think you start with uh, a people and their historical experience, which is, I think, the thing that's most important, that it shapes certain expectations they have and certain values and so on. Then something happens, and uh, in some cases, it produces a sense of grievance, a sense of unhappiness, a sense of deprivation, whatever it is, that gets them in the mood that they might be willing to go to war in certain circumstances. Then the circumstances either lead to that or not. But I think leadership is absolutely critical. I think, in other words, there was nothing inevitable about the Germans acting in such a way as to provoke the two world wars. I think that if there had been Bismarck-like leaders, I don't mean precisely like him, but people who saw the world in the way that he did and saw Germany's interests in the way he did more or less, there was no need for the First World War. Kaiser William II came along and he had a, a series of goals and desires and attitudes that indeed made Germany dangerous. But this was, I don't believe this was necessary. Germany didn't have to go that way. There were elements in Germany that he could play upon, but the leadership, in my view, was critical. Likewise, sure, all the Germans were unhappy about the Versailles Treaty and about what happened to them after the First World War. And sure, just about every German wanted to revise that in some way. But not every German was prepared to go to war to do it. And certainly not every German had the demonic desires and goals that Adolf Hitler had, which were way beyond simply restoring Germany to a position of strength in the Europe. Well, let me ask it a little differently. If Hitler lived in France... Could he have had any success? Could he have had the same success in France, motivating the people the same way he did in Germany? No, because the French didn't have the same kinds of sense of grievance. I mean, I think you have... To, a, a Hitler is possible mostly, if at all, in a country that feels defeated and humiliated. But the French, of course, had won. But let me keep asking on this point. Sure. There are 60 million Frenchmen and there are 81 million Germans right now. They live side by side, have forever and ever. Why are those two countries so different? I think it's because of the, the historical experience is the, is the main reason. And of course, certain, certain reality. Of course, not, the, not, it's not the people then. I don't think even by the people, you know, what, what, what we don't need. There's a strain to the people. Or or, yeah. No, I don't, I don't really think so. I think it's their history and the way they look at themselves in their country. By the way, those differences seem to me to be much less today than they were 50 years ago. That's another point that's worth making, and that looks towards a more optimistic idea about peace in Europe. What was it about the British people that had them stretch out across the world, and as you say here, have the largest empire in the history of the world? I don't have a very good answer to that. I mean, I, th that shouldn't have happened so far as I can tell. Uh, here was this little island with a rather small population that struggled for centuries not to be conquered by nasty guys from the other side of the channel, uh, and yet suddenly emerges in the 19th century particularly, but already beginning in the 17th and 18th centuries, to grow to uh, extraordinary uh, degrees of power. Part of it is in a way, chance, geographical. Given the way things developed in Europe and the, the focus of European economic strength moved westward, away from the Mediterranean and northward to the Atlantic, Britain is superbly located to take advantage of the growing importance of trade uh, and uh, technological developments that favored a country like that. But it's not good enough. I mean, that's part of the story. Uh, you'd have to go through a very complex story about what makes for success in these things. I think, personally, that the degree of freedom that England enjoyed, which was much greater than that of the continental states, joined with the uh, relatively open society that allowed people from the lower classes to make their way gradually into the upper classes, joined with the amazing technological revolution that really got rolling in England in the 18th century, produced a peculiar situation that gave the British what they needed to be as powerful as they were in the 19th century. In your conclusions, uh, you say that statistically war has been more common than peace, and we talked about the yeah. Durant figures there. Then you write this, the cases we have examined indicate that goodwill, unilateral disarmament, the avoidance of alliances, teaching and preaching of the evils of war by those states who generally satisfied with the state of the world seek to preserve peace are of no avail. That's right. And my main uh, uh, laboratory for that is between the two world wars, when those were the attitudes that dominated the West, and it was widely thought in, in France and England and in the United States that if you followed that course of action, that was your best chance of avoiding war, but I think it's pretty clear they helped to bring on the war.
Because if not everybody thinks that way, it's a very dangerous way to think. You say also the United States and its allies, the states with the greatest interest in peace and the greatest power to preserve it, appear to be faltering in their willingness to pay the price in money and the risk of lives. Yes. I, uh, I allow myself from time to time to be a bit fearful about what's happening now. It sounds silly. We are, we are so strong. There aren't any evident uh, dangerous enemies out there waiting for us. But you know what? In 1919 and 20 and 21, it looked exactly the same. And all sorts of people, even very wise ones, were making predictions along the lines that we're just not going to have this kind of war anymore. There isn't any need for arms. America and Britain just about totally disarmed. The British adopted a policy that said, act as though there will be no war for 10 years, and then they kept bumping it up year after year after year. Uh, when, when Churchill, of all people, was, was uh, uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer in the 1920s, he made a statement about there's no danger of a war, and there's no chance of a war with Japan, and it was only going to be a very few years before Japan was going to invade Manchuria. What I'm getting at is you cannot take comfort in a momentary situation things change fast and the history of the human race is there's trouble ahead and you'd better act as though there were and try to do something about it what's the main motive in your opinion <clears throat> for going to war well the thing that astonished me as i looked at this was i'd always felt that it was too simple to think as people did between the wars that they were really basically rational reasons that motivated people that, that they wanted more land that they wanted to have a better economic situation that this was widely thought to be the important thing and what I find in every case is that something that Thucydides called honor is the decisive element. And that sounds a little surprising to us. But if you think by honor, if we were to translate it into a current idiom, very often that means a sense of being valued, a sense of being respected, a sense of a prestige, that these are things that matter. Uh, I find that that's present in just about every case. Based on that then, where, as you look around the world, do you see a country that's going to want that honor, that I, prestige? I, I tell you, a country that worries me uh, quite a lot is the former Soviet Union, because their position now is well below what is normal for Russia and what they have come to expect, and that they will suffer, I think, a number of humiliations even more before they're finished. It's going to be hard to take. So that's a delicate problem that I would worry about over the long range. Another place I would worry about is China, where you know China has this great, magnificent civilization, the longest continuous one in the history of the world. They've never lost their sense of their specialness and their greatness, but for quite a long time, their position in the world hasn't, been, uh, hasn't matched that. Now their economy is growing at such a tremendous clip that, and their numbers are so great that they may feel that they're not being respected adequately and that I see some potentiality of trouble there. Your book is endorsed on the back by George Shultz, former Secretary of State under Republican administration, David Boren, former chairman, former senator, for a Democrat, now head of the University of Oklahoma, uh, General Edward Meyer, retired U.S. Army, and Joseph Lieberman, current Democrat and a senator from the state of Connecticut, What's that, what message does that give somebody when they pick it up? Well, of course, it's, uh, I'm tremendously grateful that they liked what I had to say, but I, I look upon these people as both a very experienced and very well-educated people who have been grappling with the problems of uh, American security and world peace for a long time in all sorts of practical ways. So it's a great source of great uh, comfort to me that they think that what I have to say in this book might be helpful. And, in the minds of decision makers. How about the cover of this book? What are we looking at? You know, I didn't pick that, but that looks to me like it's a scene from the First World War. It looks like uh, sort of one of those terrible scenes of slaughter in the trenches on the Western Front. That would be my guess. You, so you didn't have anything to say? I, did I, did I, you have anything to say about the, the title of the book? Yes. Um, I, I should point out that they, just because there were not enough, not enough room on the front, the title of the whole book is On the Origins of War and the Preservation of Peace. And that, that occurred to me in the middle of the writing of the book. I thought I was writing a book on the origins of war. At a certain point, I realized that's not what I'm writing about. I'm writing about the dual topic because I think there's a, such a close relationship. Why didn't they put the whole title on the front cover? I think it was aesthetics. I think they felt it would be too busy.
Earlier, we were talking about the kind of people you'd like to meet and talk with, and you mentioned Thucydides and Pericles. Yeah. Who else, of all these people you write about? Let's see. I guess um, I, I would have liked to talk to Bismarck. Uh, he strikes me as such an interesting, complex guy. I don't think I would have liked him much personally, and he probably wouldn't have thought much of me either. Uh, and Why I, is that? Well, I think he was a, an upper-class Junker, German. He wouldn't have approved of my origins, and he wouldn't, didn't think much of college professors anyway. Uh, and he was uh, the, the, an enemy of democracy. Was he the guy that, that said, made the quote about the sausages and, and laws shouldn't be seen? I can't remember. But he was very funny. He, was, he had he just lots and lots of wonderful quips that were terrific. Uh, one, I, this one of my story, I, I love this. That he was uh, negotiating a treaty with the Austrian chancellor. Uh, Austrian uh, foreign minister, uh, who was a very little guy. Bismarck was a huge guy, big and tall, and by this time sort of very corpulent. And, and he said to uh, this other fellow, uh, so you will have to do it my way or else. Well, actually, little guy was a banty rooster of a chap, and he said, or else what? And Bismarck said, or else I shall have to do it your way. And uh, he was a charming uh, kind of a guy, but I think he was not my kind of fellow. My point, though, is that he was, he was hostile to democracy, he was a, a, a royalist. Uh, there were all sorts of things I wouldn't have enjoyed about his domestic politics. But when it came to the realm of foreign policy, he was as rational a man uh, in his operation as I've ever seen, with a very subtle and profound understanding of what counts in the world, and a, and a capacity to, to uh, use, it's an amazing thing, to use power in such a way, not as to force your will on people, but as to, as a negotiating tool, as a way of achieving your goal, but without having to use force if you didn't have to. What's your next book about? Uh, I think it's Back to the Ancient World next time. There's a wonderful Athenian citizen, politician, and general who I feel has gotten too little credit and interest in the, in the works even of professionals, and I want to write a book about him. His name? Thrasybulus. Donald Kagan is his name. He's a professor at Yale University, and here's what the book looks like on the origins of war. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. The war in the former Yugoslavia is now between states. I mean, the Bosnians are fighting among themselves, that's true, but Serbia is a separate country, and Serbia is clearly engaged in what I think is aggression against Bosnia, and Croatia is a state, and the Croatians are engaged. So yes, I guess that's certainly one example. How does, right now, in this world, compare to all the years that have gone before us? I mean, in terms of how much fighting is and how serious the fighting is. Right. This, this is a, a pretty good time compared to many. Uh, there isn't a major war going on anywhere in the world involving very large populations and so on. Uh, and the number of real wars going on is probably fewer than has been true for much of the time. Uh, so yeah, I think we're in a relatively peaceful time just now. When did you first get interested in war yourself? Well, I was always interested in history. And of course, history, the study of history is inevitably very much in, involved in the study of war for the reasons that the Durants make clear. So from a f fairly early time. But I only became seriously interested in it and professionally interested in it when I was. But of course, these are terribly smart kids. And uh, something about a 16-year-old kid that sparks you in a way that very little else does. What year was that? I guess it was 67. Yes, it was 67, 1967. What do high school kids care about at that Well, of age? course, the Vietnam War was just coming into people's consciousness in a serious way at that point. And, of course, we had to treat that one as one of the examples. So that was very much on their minds. And every war, it was, in a way, it was a wonderful learning device because every war we looked at, even ancient ones, they saw with a special uh, vividness because they were thinking about the Vietnamese thing. And so when we got to Vietnam, it had, of course, a very special and powerful meaning for them, uh, having looked at these other ones by comparison. Now, for your book, you picked, I believe, five different yes. wars or the Cuban crises. Missile crisis, Cuban right. missile crisis. Tell us what those five were and why did you pick them? Yeah. Uh, there are two ancient wars, two modern wars, and then the missile crisis where there's a happy ending. Uh, the, the first one is the Pelican thing has changed so much as to make it unlikely in the future. 
There are some bright spots to go with the dark spots. I think that the uh, presence of nuclear weapons actually does help to deter war. Uh, but, of course, it, it's a high price, because if you, if you miss with one of those situations, the price for going to war is that much greater. Even so, since nuclear weapons, there have been wars. There haven't been the great big ones that we were accustomed to in the 20th century, but there have been very serious wars and continue to be. You quoted uh, from the 1968 uh, Will and Ariel Durant book on civilization, I believe, that uh, in 3,421 years, there have only been 268 years without war. Yeah. What do you call war, though? I call war the organized use of violence and force to achieve the end of a political entity, something along those lines. Uh, against another political entity, states. Let's use the word state because that's really what we're talking about. Are there wars going on around the, around the world now? Let me think. Um, this, yes, because by definition... The this week on Book Notes, our guest is Donald Kagan, professor of history, classics, and Western civilization at Yale University. He joins us to discuss his recent book, On the Origins of War. Donald Kagan, author of On the Origins of War, you say in the introduction that you started this first by teaching it to high school kids. Yes. It's a very strange and interesting, wonderful experience. They're at Cornell University, they have a, a scholarship house. Uh, and in, as one of their recruiting devices, they go all around the country, pick out some of the brightest high school juniors, just finished their junior year, bring them to Cornell and expose them to a couple of Cornell professors or a couple of professors, uh, in a seminar of some kind or another. So a colleague of mine and I uh, d dreamed up this idea of doing one uh, comparative study of the origins of war. And uh, it was wonderful just because the subject was so exciting for the Phoenician War, in which the Athenians and the Spartans are the major opponents, the First World War, the Second Punic War between Rome and Carthage, the Second World War, and the Missile Crisis itself. And we, I don't move uh, chronologically. I do it by those two pairs before we get to the missile crisis because I find that there are very interesting analogies between the Peloponnesian War and the First World War and the Punic War and the Second World War. And one of my uh, inquiries, really, when I got started was to see, can you learn anything useful about things we're interested in today by examining uh, experiences of human beings at different periods of time, different places, different kinds of societies. Is there anything common? And so I, when I thought I saw some interesting analogies, I put them together to help to be instructive in that way. Is war inevitable? <clears throat> I hate to say anything is inevitable in the human realm. What I can say is that there's hardly been a time in human history when there hasn't been war. And I must say, regretfully, that I don't see that any 